you see me. Should I join without video? No, with video. Uh, no, without video. All right, good evening everybody. And thank you for joining us this evening for the Great Mind session, uh, first of hopefully many. My name is Darren Adair with American Hospitality Consulting. I really appreciate all of you joining us this evening and looking forward to hearing from as many of you as possible talking about the ways we can help uh, the restaurants and the, the hospitality industry that we all love so much time and energy into. We have some great minds joining us today. I'm really excited about uh, hearing from a lot of you on, on different topics we're going to be talking about. So um, the whole idea for tonight really came from a couple of things. And it started, and I'm just going to kind of share something with you guys here. It started with, first of all, hearing a lot of different things uh, you know, seeing the, the news stories and uh, the restaurants that are closing and all the negative things that we're hearing out there, but then seeing some really positive things, uh, different restaurants that were doing what I call that outside of the box, outside of the box thinking. Restaurant close to me, there's a full service restaurant, Whiskey Inferno, um, great uh, ribs and, and smoked meats and full service. They actually recently turned a container, a shipping container into a drive through window so they could better serve their guests coming through to the pickup. No getting out of your car in the cold. I'm up in Minnesota right now. Um, just facilitating a much better dining experience, faster, more efficient. Just it's that type of thinking. And I've heard a bunch of different ideas like that. So I wanted to get together a bunch of people to talk about those types of ideas. What can we do? What can all of these great minds put together to share with other members of the hospitality industry? Now, this is not a political conversation. This is not about the president should have done this, the prime minister should have done that. That's not what we're talking about today. There's a time and place for those discussions. Today, we're gonna to be talking about everybody on the line who has some great ideas and wants to truly help these restaurants survive until basically next summer, because we know even with the, the uh, vaccines coming out, it's gonna take some time before we're back to anywhere close to what normal was. And we know it's not going to be the same as it was before. So I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing some of those ideas. Now, again, these are just ideas being shared. There's no guarantees they're going to work for you. They may have worked for somebody else. You know, you decide what's best for your business um, when, when going with that. But it's really, it's an opportunity to learn from each other, to help someone in need to talk about building a stronger network. Maybe we can collectively come together and build some networks here that we can use to help each other out in the different parts of the country and the world because we have people joining us from all over the world. Um, so with that, oops, sorry guys. Um, there's kind of four topics that I came up with, we can, we might stick to these, we might not, but just talking about different things that I've seen out there that I think can help, um, things that I don't think are being done to their fullest extent, and I wanted to get your feedback on it. So delivery, ghost kitchens, online stores, and kind of family style dining or yourself type stuff. Those are some of the things that I thought we might be wanting to discuss today. Um, I will get us started off and kind of share some of the stuff that I've thought about. But I also want, because we have so many people on the line, if you have something you want to share, if you want to give some feedback on a topic, please just put a note in the chat function. Just, you know, say, hey, I've got something to share. We'll unmute your line. Uh, just basically give your name, uh, where you're from, and, you know, kind of share your thoughts on, uh, on the topic. All right, I am going to be taking notes of this. Like I said, I'll be sharing this all out after the fact because the whole concept is to make sure that we're leaving this with some ideas to help our restaurants. All right. So without further ado, I'd like to start off uh, talking a little about a bit of delivery. And I'm going to actually share with all you guys. Um, and hopefully it comes out to you.
And if it doesn't, I apologize, but, um, and of course everything I did doesn't work. But basically what I'd like to start with is talking about delivery. And just by typing in the chat, my first question was, for some reason I'm seeing a lot of restaurants in different areas that haven't gotten on working with a delivery company. If you're not typically in that delivery space, you feel that this is a necessity now for our restaurant businesses. Is this something that restaurants should be engaged in? My opinion is it's something that you basically need to do. If you're not currently in that space, if you haven't found a way to reach your guests, because as it's getting colder in a lot of the areas that we're all in, if you're not finding ways to get, they may not be able to get to you, right? So, David, I'm going to actually unmute you. If you, you can also unmute yourself. Um, why don't you ask that question out loud? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, hello, everyone. Uh, David here from a company called Line 10. I'm actually Irish, but um, based in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, fell in love with the mountains, skiing, and <laughs> terrible things they call IPAs, beers. Um, so, and ramen, for some reason, Calgary has really good ramen. If anybody wants to come up here and try the ramen, it's delicious. Uh, I'm also a massive nice. foodie, huge restaurant fan. I bartended and I was terrible, shocking at bartending, but, uh, I had very patient bar managers that let me away with murder because I could sell, uh, you know, desert sand to, to anyone basically. So <laughs> I, I recently, I, I joined line 10 about three years ago and, and now head up their North American operations. And I saw this great uh, so darren thanks for hosting this and you know yeah. be, if i'm really honest with you we've had a lot of teething pains as a delivery platform uh, so just so you know what we do is we're not like a, a third-party marketplace like doordash we don't have an e-commerce engine where you go on and you see line 10 and then you see your brand we're just white labeled so you would use our dashboard to book deliveries through your own online site right but we've still had challenges food delivery is hard it's tough it's fast uh it's uh often tricky to explain to restaurateurs, to retailers. A lot of people don't understand, you know, if you want to deliver 10 kilometers out, sometimes it will take longer than 30 minutes if you're in the wrong city, the wrong conurbation. Um, and so for me, I've kind of learned after trying to sell everything I could to actually just turn around and try and listen as much as I could. And so that's why I asked the question. I'd love to hear some of the experience that people have had on the call, either with delivery platforms like Line 10, where essentially you get access to delivery companies in different places. Uh, that offer on-demand delivery or catering delivery. And then also, uh, you know, your experience maybe working with marketplaces like DoorDash or Postmates or some of those other, or Skip the Dishes. Um, and, and just to hear maybe some of the, the good things, a lot of people say, hear the frustrations. I definitely want to hear the frustrations, but if you kind of have some good things as well, I, I'd love to hear about that uh, rather than me talking about ideas I have just yet, because I can talk for Ireland. Okay. I'm sure you're all aware. So. <laughs> Hey, All right, Andrew. thanks, David. We've actually got somebody here, Bruce Pasco. Bruce, I'm going to, uh, if I can get you unmuted here, if you can try and unmute yourself as well and can just kind of share what you uh, shared in the chat. Yeah, I just think you should uh, be open. I think the mistake that uh, operators make is just having the same pricing model they do inside or for pickup on delivery and, and with companies charging up to 30%. I mean, that's untenable, right? You can't keep that going for very long. It'll provide you with volume, but absolutely no profit. So if I was an operator today, I'd have a delivery specific menu and I'd price as much of that 30% in as I could because uh, the folks that are using that service are using it for a reason. They're you know isolated, they're quarantined. Uh, maybe they live farther out of the city. Um, and, and where I live, I don't have any delivery apps. I, I have to go get it anyway. But uh, right. I think people will pay for that uh, service. And even moving into the future, the, the folks that are using DoorDash and Skip the Dishes, Grubhub, they're, they're millennials that are you know, willing to pay for that experience of having the food delivered and, and not having to, they don't have a car, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but the mistake I see is operators are just sharing the same pricing platform that they do if you come dine in or pick up your own. That's a mistake. Good, thanks. You know, and, and there is a lot of um, 
discussion around the pricing. And I think that is one of the barriers I, I hear a fair bit when I'm talking to operators about, you know, getting into delivery and why they're not doing it. It is uh, the price point. And I think there might be some misconceptions that maybe we can, people can share a little bit about as we're chatting. Um, uh, Shanika, thank you. She says it's an absolute necessity. Um, Doug, no, I'm going to find which Doug this is. I don't know if it was Yep, Mr. Gunn, there you are. If you can unmute yourself and uh, kind of just share what your thought was on that. Just a, a, uh, and hi, Chantel. Good to see you. Good to see the uh, the Adairs and some friends on the call. Uh, a couple of things. I, I, I kind of deviate away from the thought of having a higher price menu because I think uh, there's less operating costs associated with having delivery only. When we had our last close shutdown, um, my friend owns a restaurant in the neighborhood and he offered us a discount. So we would get 20, 20 to 30% off if we picked it up and uh, he would rather give the discount to his customers and give it to, uh, to uh, skip the dishes. However, I still think that the opportunity is, is that we know that in Alberta, we are going to be shut down after during Christmas Restaurants need to be ready. They need to be training their staff. They need to be getting ready and taking a look at stuff like that. Uh, also making sure that their customers know signage goes up. Start promoting now that you have a delivery service. Let's start now know what, letting customers know what you can do. I saw one restaurant in Calgary had a banner. Must have been 30 feet long saying uh, DoorDash. So obviously that restaurant's trying to promote DoorDash. So those are just a couple of thoughts that I have. Okay, great. Thanks, Doug. Um, I'm going to, uh, yeah, uh, David, I'll come back to you in just a second. I just wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, Antonio, um, just if you want to clarify your point and then I'm going to go to David and then I'm going to go to, uh, um, Jason, uh, McMillan after that. So Antonio, uh, Rico, if you can just unmute yourself and, and kind of clarify your point there. Sure. It sounds it sounds like with um, as a result of everything going on right now that um, sort of uh, uh, cleanliness and sanitation is the is is the new is the new way that that brands can can sh uh, can can share like their level of hospitality in food and beverage um, to where like the extra steps that a brand can take and how food is sealed and packaging and and, and packaging is done to help eliminate concern from the from the end user um it's things that my my teammates and i we we were paying more and more attention to this like did you see did you see did you see how they you know the branded tape that was that was on that was on the bag that just sort of gave it that extra level of that extra level of of care you know that's that would set brand a apart uh, apart from brand b that's the clarification. Okay, I think, and I agree with you, there's definitely a, a much larger um, focus on food safety and sanitation. Not that it wasn't a focus of the majority of us in the past. I know as a former food safety trainer, it was something that I was always very focused on, um, but it, there is that new level, you know, with the gloves we are wearing, masks we are wearing, and just, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions, but it's doing the right things to make sure that we're providing safe uh, food to uh, to our guests. David, I'm going to come to you right now for your point, and then Jason, I'll be over to you, and then we're going to have to unfortunately move on to the next topic. But uh, David Lynch, if you uh, add your point. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Just it's really interesting reading some of the comments, and the last one there is I think there's an opportunity for all of us who interact with restaurant over owners to help them understand the economics of delivery and how it could work for them. So my thoughts on it is, you know, I think uh, there's there's two pieces to the puzzle, like listening to all these comments from, from my learnings to date in the business we're in. There's owning the customer journey. So having your own online ordering journey where the customer goes on to yourfood.com and then orders from you. The challenge with that is uh, on-demand delivery companies have diminished dramatically as uh, you know, food marketplace like DoorDash have taken those drivers and really perfected on-demand delivery uh, to some degree. And so there's a middle ground. DoorDash and Postmates have offered companies like Line 10 an API that allows us to actually use their fleet as a white-labeled fleet. So you can take control of your own online ordering journey, 
but use their fleet. That's the first piece. However, I still think DoorDash is helpful. I think volume shift is helpful. I don't understand the unit economics enough, I think, in a restaurant to really comment on how helpful it is. I just know from a lot of friends of mine who've owned restaurants, although it's a it's a healthy cut, DoorDash at 30%, uh, almost almost too unhealthy, in fact, you know, there is volume that needs to be shifted to maintain a, a level of supply ch chain efficiencies within a restaurant, especially during this time. And I think the last thing I would suggest is where you have kind of a dichotomy of both. So essentially you have DoorDash and you have the Postmates, but you also focus on your direct relationships with your customers, you know, and to that point that was made about getting the packaging and the, the detail right, that's where you can leave your branding, contact in for information, a discount if you book direct through an online ordering journey. Um, but, you know, I think another thing that can be educated to the end customer is, you know, if they really love your food and they love your restaurant, there might be a, an opportunity to educate them on the possibility of paying more for delivery to deliver, to have a direct relationship with you. And the reason why I say that is it's very hard for a customer ordering through DoorDash to really understand the unit economics and the breakdown. It almost teaches them to ignore it. But if you can educate customers by having, having them one, order through your own online ordering journey, and two, even teach them that their ability to pay for more. So if a cost of delivery that they see is $2.50 and you're saying $5 and this is where it's going, I think that's a really healthy next step for the end customer. I know personally as a foodie, if I knew why it was $5 and not $2.50 and I was ordering directly, uh, there's a holistic experience that I get there from having a more connected experience altogether with the retailer. I hope that makes sense to all of you online. That's me on that. I think your your mic's uh, been turned off there, Darren. So I'll, I'll just go ahead and jump in. <clears throat> My name is Jason McMillan. I work with Real Hospitality Network. Uh, that's based out of Calgary. I'm actually in Victoria, BC. Uh, I've been in the hospitality industry over 30 years, uh, and I was unfortunately one of the ones in, in June to uh, uh, lose my, my position as a general manager in a fine dining restaurant, cafe, and sushi bar uh, come June. So I uh, had to shift and uh, spent the better part of a month uh, refabricating uh, an entire fine dining restaurant to be able to um, operate in, in this situation. I think that there's from my standpoint, I look at uh, delivery platforms in, in two ways. One, uh, if you're closed uh, and we can't do in-seat dining, uh, I definitely see a uh, possibility to generate revenue without question because you don't have your front of house staff <clears throat> working in. So there's your 30%. Uh, so on that aspect, it works. I think if you're operating a facility that is busy uh, and successful already, um, to be able to tack on more dollars and lose the 30%, I think there's value in there. Um, that middle road uh, is extremely difficult to navigate when you've got a kitchen brigade, you've got your front of house staff working uh, to be able to justify that 30%. I think that's where that gray, that gray area is. <clears throat> Discussing, having these discussions most every day with a lot of my clients through RHN uh, and, and just friends, friends in the industry, um, what we're starting to see and, and see a bit of a success is uh, limiting your menu um, for delivery uh, and taking your heavy hitters and only putting it on um, on Skip the Dishes, DoorDash, and Uber Eats. So the ones that are that that you've costed out to um, 14, 15, 18 percent, those are the only ones that ever go on delivery to go out your front door. Um, so the other thing is from and and I'm, I'm doing some consulting as well uh, on the side, and some of those conversations are based around have have operators chefs and GMs done the work on the back end with their menus to know exactly where their food costs are. Where is everything going? What are, what are your, your number one sellers and what are your number one sellers coming in at from a food cost? If you're sitting anywhere in the 30, 40% mark, it's got to come off the menu. So I think that there's some back end work that um, hasn't been done in our industry probably since the, since the 90s, uh, where there's truly that evaluation of where our numbers are at. But I've been encouraging people to really dive into those numbers, know exactly uh, what the heavy hitters are, and really build a, a condensed menu to support all the heavy hitters. Uh, turn those, those 20, 22% food cost items uh, into your number one sellers, and then bring those ones along with you when it comes to delivery. 
Um, so th that's that's kind of my my ten cents on that one. But bridging that gap between uh, you know having a restaurant that's that's half full and and I understand the situation that we're in, as well as doing delivery, I, I think that's a recipe um, to put yourself in a in a pretty tough position uh, without really understanding the costs. So um okay. for, for what it is there's my 10 cents so i, I do okay. appreciate it darren thank you yeah thank you sir mr mortimer i'm going to let you uh close off this topic before we move on to the next one so if you just want to uh share your last thoughts there yeah i think it's just uh you know i think it's incumbent on everyone as as we look forward obviously consumers have changed the way that they use restaurants and and that's going to continue into the future and that's going to create um opportunities for those restaurants who are able to uh, who don't have drive through So QSR sector has been fortunate in, in being able to survive with drive through but being able to look at other ways of delivering their service. And delivery clearly is one point. Uh, you know, we talk about curbside pickup. We talk about all of these types of things. And so depending on what uh, sector you're in, if you're in fast casual, you're in fine dining, there's got to be a different solution. And as I talk to, uh, to restaurant owners, they're looking to try and recreate um, the physical facility to be able to accommodate uh, whether it's curbside, whether it's uh, creating, I thought your example of using the uh, the container uh, for a drive-through was, was a fantastic one. And uh, I think that shows the ingenuity of people there. And, uh, you know, I think in Canada, although I'm in Arizona at the moment, I think, you know, when I'm back home in Canada, one of the biggest challenges as an industry we need to face is being able to lobby governments to be able to um, change or, or rework liquor laws to allow uh, restaurants particularly in fast casual and fine dining who make so much money off their liquor to be able to deliver liquor, to have some sort of takeout service for liquor. Uh, here in Arizona, you know, we can go to a restaurant, we can pick up a prepared meal and a bottle of wine and cocktails or whatever, and it's all delivered to the car at curbside. And so, um, you know, I think that's something, obviously our, our liquor laws in Canada are a little bit more archaic, archaic but uh, that's gonna be something that I think as an industry, uh, there's a lobbying effort there that, that needs to happen. Good. No, good points. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, there, there are some definite opportunities there. Um, you know, and if, if you want to see, uh, I did share out the uh, the information on that restaurant on our road. It's called Whiskey Inferno, whiskeyinferno.com. You can see a video of their drive through. It is really cool to see. They've got it covered as well for the elements and the uh, okay Christmas tree right beside it. So it's pretty cool. Uh, guys, thank you so much for the call. I know we got a lot of comments that are guys, but I do want to get on to another topic that's kind of taking delivery to that next step. Um, and that's talking about ghost kitchens. And are ghost kitchens going to be the future of the hospital restaurant industry? There's, you know, we've read a lot of polls where they're saying this is going to be a $1 trillion business in 10 years. Uh, I'm seeing them pop out around me. The restaurant I was just talking about has, has got an Italian uh, concept coming out of their uh, their uh, their their smokehouse restaurant. There's a couple other ones in our area. I'd love to hear somebody who has gotten into the ghost kitchen or has done some investigation on the ghost kitchen piece and just kind of give us some background on what are you seeing? You know, is this? It seems to be like it's going to be a, a great opportunity. It has been because I know there are some guys doing really well with it. Um, love to hear some feedback from somebody on uh, on ghost kitchens. If you're in that space, okay. Medea, um, Medea Tertian, you say, "Oh my God, yes, ghost kitchens." Um, uh, if you want to unmute yourself and, and share some of your feedback, that would be awesome. Hi, so I'm Medea. I worked in the kitchen for three years before. But I personally haven't done this on my own, but I'm familiar with people who have worked in the ghost kitchens. And they, to me, they feel that it's much more easier because in that sense that um, it's more convenient for the math people. I'm from Arjun from Bangladesh. So people over there are doing it because, you know, pandemic is hitting really hard there. And in here, I've come across um, a few projects. Like I don't know if you've heard of Boxed the project that's going on. So Boxed also does Ghost Kitchen as well. And I've also heard a little bit about it from people like Lionel Duke from ex Bar Chef, like he was, he was working at Bar Chef, as well as Tomer Markowitz. Those are two people I've been talking to recently about the Ghost Kitchen, um, sort of like the ways, the Ghost Kitchen approach. And I feel that you're right, it is the future, but I'm still learning about it. And I want to know like how, is it being developed? Like what are the ways people in Toronto are dealing with ghost kitchen and how can we all contribute to that? 
Good, thank you. Um, Sayed, I'm going to get you to uh, unmute yourself, but you know, I, it seems that there's a lot of people getting into this. Um, there's even a story down here, the um, Milwaukee Bucks have started running a ghost kitchen out of their, uh, their arena complex to try and you know, give people jobs. Um, you know, it, in my mind, it's a great way to continue building loyalty. It's going to keep your people working. It is going to help save on food costs. But um, Syed, you say you have uh, uh, some research that you've done on this. Syed Babar Hassan. Um, yeah. Hi. Hello, everyone. You are. Okay. Yeah. So I'm Babar. I have recently moved to Canada, let's say four months ago. So I was working in UAE, specifically in Dubai. So uh, I would add to my experience what I've uh, done in the past. Lately, I was working in the hospitality and the food and beverage and nightlife industry in Dubai. And then when I moved here, uh, before moving, let's say, we had to shift most of our retail business or our outlets or food franchises that we had to most of the cloud kitchen concept. Now, this cloud kitchen concept is similar to a ghost kitchen concept, you can say. Uh, where mostly what the ultimate reason of these concepts to come up is uh, to avoid the cost that you're bearing through the aggregators. By aggregators, I mean the delivery aggregators, such as Uber Eats, worldwide you have Deliveroo here, you have DoorDash, Skip the Dishes and all these concepts. So to bring the cost down from let's say the 35% or 30% 30, 30 of the cost that you know, you're bearing on all your orders, this concept has, has started, let's say, one year back, just one year ago, or let's say one and a half year ago, but it is doing tremendously really very well. In Canada as well, I already know of kitchens like Reef Kitchens and uh, another concept of Coast Kitchens, which is again coming from America, and it is moving ahead quite fast. So you won't only see small businesses or small uh, food outlet operators coming onto these concepts. Eventually, I think the larger, the bigger brands would also move into this concept because this is relatively new. It's just not about cutting down your cost of the aggregators in the end. It just it becomes about cutting down your uh, outlet cost, uh, moving most of your business into cloud system. Then there's an involvement of POS systems, how your payments and your marketing and everything can be connected uh, into one system and uh, your personal, your human resource cost is going down and overall your retail outlet cost is going down as well. So briefly, this is the concept, but uh, I mean, it's getting a lot of help due to the pandemic. COVID, we shouldn't be saying that, but, but that's honestly a fact where you cannot really have a retail outlet or a food outlet and you have to shift to such businesses. So you will see uh, a lot of ghost kitchens and cloud kitchens opening up in the coming months, or let's say, uh, in the coming year. Uh, and this won't just be small businesses trying to survive, I feel. Uh, and I think uh, you will see small business, uh, larger businesses and larger brands even uh, coming onto the board. And yeah, that's what I think. And that's what my research says. And I'm also myself looking into cloud kitchen concepts as well. So Good. that's why I've looked into this. Nice. Thank you very much for sharing. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen a variety of different uh, levels of business getting into this types of restaurants. So, it, you know, it, it intrigues me. Um, you know, I've, I've uh, had a people you know, that I've had some good discussions with, but Mr. Nadeau, uh, I think I'll turn it over to you. You said you had some stuff you wanted to share. Uh, yeah, thank you, Darren, for, for doing this tonight. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's a lot of great ideas. So one of the ones that I recently just uh, experienced, one of my customers uh, who owns uh, Middle Eastern uh, restaurant platform, uh, Paramount Fine Foods out of the Toronto area. Um, again, you know, some great advice that we heard around paring down the menu and really looking at putting the right things on the menu in terms of aggregator and catering. You know, they did a great job at doing that. But one of the other ways they maximize the footprint of their building, because they are quite large buildings and they're closed. And so uh, what do you do? And so Muhammad got very creative and did a little bit of homework and created two new brands. And so he created a new fried chicken brand um, and he created a new pizza brand with a local chef that appeared up in the market. And quite frankly, you know, we really, he really broke it down into pieces because he knew what his existing businesses were doing uh, out of the first shutdown. 
Um, and then you say, well, I need to add X amount of dollars to make, to make my franchisees, to make this work for my franchisees. And so the creation of the brands has actually, with the media that he's put behind it, have really uh, almost uh, uh, taken his Paramount food sales and made, made it at par with the other two brands. So he now has three brands that are cooking out of, of one kitchen in the back. Operationally, there's some challenges uh, to, to make all this happen, but it's, it's, really, um, it's really great to see how people pivot really quick in a time and when they need to. You know, you know, again, you know, a lot of things we saw and we talked about today, even around around curbside and aggregators and delivery, you know, this this customer, uh, Mohammed or Paramount, uh, put all those in place right away. And I think it's starting to pay dividends for him. Um, you know, we'll see what the really the outcome will be in the near future. But but I think very unique in creating brands within his brands. Um, you know, in the old days, we would have called that just a new product line, a new product offering, but he got really creative and is now calling them brands within brands. So really they are virtual kitchens or, or ghost kitchens. And, um, and he's now franchising those brands separately as well. So really, uh, that was one of the examples that I think was really creative in the market here in the Toronto market. Yeah, great, thanks, appreciate that. Um, and there's, uh, I think uh, Mr. Gunn had also mentioned uh, Paramount and, and the great job they had done uh, in the Toronto area. So I'm not sure if uh, I think Suzanne has stepped away. I was going to bring her in on a little bit of a, uh, a different perspective to this. I'll come back to her in a bit. But, you know, there are some tools. I know here in the U.S., uh, one of the large food suppliers, U.S. Foods, has actually set up online training for their clients and potential clients to help them set up their own ghost kitchens. Now, when you think about it as a huge supplier of food, what a great idea. They're already seeing their sales, their dollars going down because their people, their, their, their clients aren't able to, uh, to spend as much money because they don't have the business coming in. So now they're helping to create these opportunities and giving them the tools to, uh, to do this for themselves. So I don't know if, is anybody seen, has that happened anywhere in Canada? I haven't seen it for any food suppliers, but I just think it's a great way for a large business like U.S. Foods to kind of help, it serves their purpose, it keeps them with clients, but it also helps get more of this going. So has anybody else seen anything like that? Or other tools to help people get in? One of the things that Cisco did in Calgary is they eliminated the minimums. So it really helped a smaller operator order and keep their inventory more managed and controlled by, you know, you, you don't have to buy a case of 24, you can buy 12. And I think that's really helpful, especially when the last lockdown happened, the province created a lot of uh, issues for many, many restaurants by being a bit wishy-washy and restaurants had a lot of inventory. So I think Cisco kind of comes out looking pretty good on that. Most definitely. Good. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate that. Good point. Uh, Bruce, you've had a couple of things. If you wanted to jump in and kind of talk a bit to that, please feel free to do so. Uh, it's okay. It's in chat. People will be able to see it and, and it'll be on Fair enough. Video. Sure. So, you know, some opportunities there. And again, guys, and I've seen this in the chat too, this isn't necessarily going to work in every uh, type of situation for every restaurant. But Mike, I like the comment you made about people being able to pivot and make those changes and change on the fly. I think we've been focusing too much on the, you know, all this stuff that's coming down and how do you not? I mean, there's been a lot of pressure. It's been very stressful, not only on your business, but personal. We've, I'm sure a lot of us have had people who have caught COVID uh, and are dealing with that kind of thing. So it's tough to see that, but it's great. You know, and that's why I wanted to do this to help people kind of see that there are other things out there that they can do. There are other opportunities and, and you know, one idea might not work. Another idea might. Um, it, it's just the restaurants that you that are doing this, like this Whiskey Inferno. Uh, I know Marco's Pizza is, is, is doing some stuff down here. And uh, I've even heard of a Compass Group back in Canada that is looking to do some stuff. There. I mean, they've got huge commercial spaces and a uh, just looking for, you know, opportunities to, to continue to, to 
grow their business and keep people employed. So, um, uh, Jeff Hillis, uh, if, if you wanted to unmute yourself and just kind of expand a little bit, okay. you said, uh, and just share a little bit on, on what you're, you're saying. Okay. Uh, um, Janet Hillis, it's my husband's Hi, account. <laughs> um, when I looked I'm, over and saw the picture. Minnesota, uh, uh, twin, uh, outside the Twin Cities, uh, very rural. Um, I am a lead cook at uh, Redwood uh, Falls, uh, what they call it, Redwood Valley uh, Schools. Um, okay. We have changed on the fly a lot um, from hybrid to in, in person to um, delivery. Um, we're doing uh, distance learning right now. Uh, that means all the food goes out of two of our kitchens. Uh, I work, um, the corporation I work for is in Minneapolis. Um, we have also had uh, uh, community, community feeds of, oh, they've been huge. And we're having another one on the 20th where people are struggling and they need need extra food, um, and that's been flying out of our our corporate too. So they've been doing like uh, small meals, frozen meals, um, and and uh, shipping it out, and and they'll be shipped out on trucks. Um, so those are things that are happening here in uh, in Minnesota. Is uh, the kids are getting fed. Um, it's been very hard because uh, at first in spring, the numbers that were way up um, and we're getting, we're getting federal support. Um, but now the numbers, because of the COVID, because of the virus upcoming so highly out here, the numbers are going way up and people are getting afraid even to uh, step out of their homes. Um, yeah. So the numbers are going down. And so there's been staff cut. And um, so it's been really trying um, at, our, yep. at our schools um, yep. to get the food out. So it's good for you to know as a restaurant, we're dealing with it too. Okay, I appreciate in that. In the schools. Yeah, no, thank you. And I'm in Minnesota as well. I just live Southwest of the city. So, okay. uh, and my wife does work in the schools. So, you know, we've, uh, we've seen it in our area as well. So, but those, those are good too. points. Yeah. So perfect. Thanks for sharing. Bruce, you just mentioned something that I want to talk about. And, and I actually did an article on this the other day. And it's we can't get away with all this stuff from the, the service, not just the quality, but also the level of service that we're providing to our guests because they're still spending their hard earned money and they're coming by those dollars a lot more difficult. It's more difficult to get them now because they're out of work. Uh, they're not getting as many hours. So if they're choosing to spend their money with us, we need to make sure what they're getting is good quality uh they're getting it hot they're getting it fresh and, and you know we touched a little bit on this earlier when we we're talking about packaging but it, it's just something we cannot lose sight of uh, because it's out our door you know we got to do whatever we can to make sure it's getting to that guest in the right way even if you're doing the curbside um, i did see something glenn i don't know if you saw this but i believe it's a restaurant in arizona i just got the article they've gone back to car hops they can't have people come inside anymore. Now, Arizona's weather is a little better than Minnesota's um, and Winnipeg, where I'm from, but they have done things to try and keep their guests coming and sit inside. So they've got socially distanced parking spots and they've created, brought back the car hop to bring the food out to the, uh, the guests waiting in their cars, which I just thought was a great idea. I mean, it, you know, how long ago was it? Not that long ago, really, when you think, um, you know, even Sonic doesn't do it that much anymore. They're the only ones I can think of right now. I remember a &W used to do it when I was a kid. It, it all disappeared because everyone thought it was too costly. Well, now here it is as an opportunity to do, to be able to service your guests. So, you know, there, there's some great things out there that uh, we can look at uh, trying to do. Uh, I think you're right, Darren. I think what's old is new again, you know, and, and I mean, I joined a and back in the 70s when we were getting out of the drive-in business because, you know, drive-throughs were now the new rage. And, uh, yep. and you're right, there are a couple down here, even our local uh, um, club here in the, in the uh, community, they've created an event around curbside. And so, you know, when you go, there's people out there, there because I think, you know, consumers are still, when you go out, you still, it, a big part of it is that interaction. It's, it's the experience 
of leaving your home to go and get a meal. And even though you're just going to pick it up and bring it home, if you can do something uh, at curbside or you know whatever uh, vehicle you're using to get the food to the consumer, uh, creating a bit of a show, creating a bit of a social interaction, um, you know, uh, talking to people about their day, that kind of stuff. Uh, like a server would do, um, creates a, a, you know creates an advantage I think for those that are able to do that and see the and see their way to that. Definitely, you, you still have to find a way to create that relationship with the guest. Absolutely. You still have to find that way to make a connection, and and you know it's reduced. Um, I mean, how much time did I think back to when we were focused on drive-through speed of service those many years ago, Glenn, trying to get things moving faster, and we had to continuously remind people Absolutely. you can't lose the hospitality piece as well. You've got to still provide that level of service um, and give them what they ordered. So, you know, statistically, at the restaurants are, sorry, statistically at the restaurants around here, I have no idea what percentage would be delivery versus curbside, but you can right. go to any, if you go to any casual or, or fast casual restaurant here uh, in the Metro Phoenix area, uh, the lineups at curbside are huge. Uh, and I think that's because people want to leave their home. They want to go out and have at least some kind of an experience for a couple of minutes uh, while they get their food rather than having you know, somebody show up at the door with it. And so yeah. um, just going for the drive for five minutes to the restaurant, I think is, is a relief point for people. Most definitely it's getting out of the house. It's seeing new scenery. There's a, there's a commercial and I can't remember who it's for right now, where a guy goes out of his house, he drives, I think it's two blocks, gets a loaf of bread and comes home. That's his daily commute. I think he picked up a coffee and a loaf of bread. That's his daily commute now because, but it gets out of the house. Right. And it, it's amazing how important that is to us uh, right now. Um, so those are great points. Um, so that kind of takes me into something else I wanted to talk about. And Bruce, you've touched on it a little bit in, in one of your comments and something that I've seen uh, in a couple of restaurants. It comes a little bit back to that developing the experience for the guest. And it's that kind of a DIY family experience of build your own. So you go to a restaurant, you pick up, you know, maybe you're doing fajitas. And it's a great thing that you can give everything separate. So the family comes home, they sit around the table and it's almost like the old days where you're doing everything in the center and everyone's kind of building their own. It creates a bit of a family experience. It gets everybody together. It just seems like that could be a good option because let's face it, foods that do not necessarily transport well, especially when they're put together. Has anybody seen anything like that? Or has anybody tried that in their restaurant and has some experience that they can share around it? Oh, well, we might have a new topic. Would anybody like to give their thoughts on that type of an idea? Because um, I think that, go ahead. It, if I may, like you, yes, you touched on experiences there. And so in, in the UK, we work with, uh, which by the way, is very, very quiet now. Um, but we worked with a catering marketplace and a number of retailers to offer catering to offices and businesses. And one thing that, you know, we always receive feedback was as part of product testing, we'd get to interview end customers and talk to them about their experience. Um, and there was definitely a heightened sense of, an experience, and I'm not, I'm not a heightened experience, if you will. Now, I'm not sure if it's because uh, psychologically you're around people enjoying the food together. So there's, rather than me in my sweatpants watching like too many episodes of a terrible TV show at home uh, with, you know, a pizza versus like being around friends and enjoying a meal together. I'm not sure if that's what helps, but I do know that one thing, you know, that would be really advantageous, and it kind of goes back to some of the previous points about, you know, hitting margins while still facilitating an amazing experience to customers and also kind of touches on that point that you just discussed about, you know, preparing more complex dishes at home is catering uh, style orientated dishes. So for example, um, when I was growing up as a kid, we used to get Chinese food all the time. And uh, one thing we used to get that we used to love the most was uh, duck uh, wraps. I don't know if that's something that you guys have a lot over in the US, but it's basically duck and you get the wraps, you also get the vegetables and you get the sauces. So as a family, it was this like fun experience of putting the meal together. And if you could take that experience and, and, and take it back, you know, incorporate that into the way you, I guess, connect with the customer. The first thing that happens obviously is, you know, you create a, a dish or a basket size that's higher. So 
generally speaking, that's that's good for everyone where your basket size is, is higher. Secondly, that basket size is more focused around a single dish and turning that single dish into multiples of that single dish. So again, it's not five different dishes, five different complex ingredient uh, combined ingredients. It's most of the time uh, one set of ingredients for one larger version of a dish. Um, and then lastly, it's something different that people don't really get at home. And I, I personally, you know, I, this is like, I, I kind of work a lot around the R and D piece in, in our business. It's something that we recently pitched to uh, Budweiser and InBev in the UK who have all these restaurants that they own, funny enough, and they need to try and take those pubs uh, online, which is quite a challenge because these are, we're talking hole in the walls here. These aren't fancy restaurants and they have to take them online as long as well as their menu online. And the thing that we actually ended up coming up with together was um, like essentially a football Sunday's catering deal because what we found was a lot of these pubs were making great revenues on the weekend for Premier League, which is like football, Premier League football outings. So a bunch of the lads would go to the pub and have about eight pints of hopefully Guinness. Uh, I'm just dreaming now, thinking of the pub back in the UK, sorry. Eight pints of Guinness. And then they would order, you know, these larger catering dishes in the pub. And, and that was kind of the experience for them. It was if, if you were the, the lad with the kid, it was the one time your wife would let you out to have a walk and a few pints with the boys to watch a football match. And you always look forward to the filthy chicken wings and the filthy whatever you were having. And so what we actually ended up doing was wrapping it into a concept and saying, take the Premier League home so that you can invite all the lads to your house. And I know that there's similar propositions for smaller restaurant groups. If you're an Indian restaurant or you're a Chinese restaurant or you know, whatever it is you're offering, there's an experience that you've created for a lot of people in those restaurants where they come together and they get the same things all the time. So Great. what you're touching on is potentially an opportunity to take that experience home so that people can continue having those experiences with their friends, continue with the food that they know so well that you make and the booze that you make, et cetera, because now you can batch in the likes of Alberta, uh, but I have it at home. So your basket size is higher and, and hopefully everybody wins, including including the retailer, most importantly. So that was just something I wanted to share. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, JJ, Mr. Fraser, um, thanks for joining. If you wanted to share, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So I've, I've seen a, a number of, of different programs kind of pop up to this uh, extent. So the, the comment I made about... Uh, about pizza, uh, I actually a, a good friend of mine owns a, a butcher shop here in, in Vancouver, and they they you know they produce uh, their own charcuterie, their own meats. Uh, they work with some specialty cheeses, but primarily they're they're a butcher, and they they right in March when every everything started to shut down, put a couple of these programs in place. One of them was a pizza kit, so they sold two uh, eight ounce balls of, of pizza dough that were frozen. Uh, they sliced their own salami and and you know, grated some cheese and put some tomato sauce together and sold a whole pizza kit for, for 25 bucks a pop. Um, you know, they thought they'd maybe sell 10 to 15 a day. And I think the last time I spoke with them, they were selling about 50 a day. Uh, and it's, it becomes an experience. It's not just, okay, this is a, you know, I need to eat and, and somewhere to order from, but you can actually involve the whole family in it. Um, you know, make it exciting. If everyone's stuck at home, there's a way to continue moving it forward. Um, but I, I've seen a number of these things. Uh, one of one of our clients uh, that owns a owns and operates a combination coffee uh, shop and grocery. They have a small grocery section. They've uh, designed an entire uh, category in their freezer section that is uh, really great lasagnas, chicken dinners, um, things that can be taken home and prepared or picked up uh, curbside. And, and it's a great way to continue on the revenue stream. Uh, I think this is a, a, you know, right now it's, it's very pertinent. Holiday season is massive revenue time for restaurants and it's not gonna be there. So how are you preparing for that? I, I had a, a post I put up yesterday actually that what, what my family's gonna do, you know, my, my extended family here in Vancouver, uh, we live in five different households. Well, we wanna have holiday Christmas dinner together. My mom's not going to cook a turkey for two people. That's that's probably she's. I was talking to someone else about it today. She's going to be eating turkey for the next month if that's the case. <laughs> so rather than go out and purchase a twenty-pound bird, uh, we're gonna 
we've sourced out uh, one of our favorite local restaurants. Um, they have put together a holiday dinner package. So for two people, 75 bucks, you get uh, a nice prepared uh, turkey stuffing gravy, all the fixings, um, sides and, and, and a dessert all in for 75 bucks. You can tack on a bottle of wine as well. I'm going to go pick them up that day and I'm going to drop them off at my sister's place for her and her kids, my parents' place, my brother's place. And then I'll have a meal as well. And then we're all going to have a meal together on zoom. And I think that's a really great opportunity to kind of create that Sunday night dinner, uh, that family gathering while you're staying apart. You can't go to each other's houses. I think there's, there's a, a number of different avenues to explore to continue driving sales out of that. You know, I've, I've also, I've, it's, been, it's been a long couple months going all the way back to March and all the different ideas that, that I've been speaking with people about. I've talked to businesses that have pivoted into uh, canning and jarring and selling um, you know, preserved goods. I myself started pickling. I was pickling like crazy in, in March, April. Um, I didn't sell any, I ate them all, but it's, uh, it's a good project to, uh, to put together a shelf stable kind of grocery store, uh, inventory to be able to get in front of your, your customer base because a lot of customers, most customers want restaurants to stick around and support it. You know, Cisco here, I I believe they're doing it across the rest of the country as well. They've uh, started their Cisco at home and, and their Cisco delivery services for that. So I think the grocery section of how we acquire groceries may continue to evolve with this. You know, we're, we're creating new habits in the restaurant industry and if restaurants can brand their own sauces and sell them, they've been doing that for years, but maybe, maybe mom and pop shops weren't thinking about it. And, and there's an opportunity for increased revenue out of that. You know what? It's, it's like you and I are on the same wavelength because that almost segues into the final topic I had. Um, and there's, you know, a couple of good things that have just come out. I know Glenn, you mentioned about virtual wine uh, tastings and Doug, you're mentioning uh, beer tastings and uh, how you tried book and one. It was booked up till March, which those are great things to hear. It's, you know, people are engaging some of this uh, new, new life that we're living in. We, we did have people down here that were doing the, the dinners for, uh, for Thanksgiving and Zoom. I don't know if they are going to do this for Christmas as well, but they took away their restrictions. So if you ordered the free version of Zoom so a family could, you know, download Zoom, get the free version, and there wasn't that 40 minute restriction for over three people. They got rid of that so families could be together. So, you know, JJ, it's a, it's a great idea to at least have some connection. You hook it into your smart TV. Uh, when the drunk uncle gets a little too obnoxious, you can just cut him off and, um, you know, uh, continue on with uh, with your evening. So um, some great ideas, but uh, we're, we've only got a few minutes left here, guys. And I, to, that kind of segued into the last topic that I really wanted to chat with about. And again, if you want to continue talking past six o'clock, I'm more than happy to do that. But um, it's the the online stores and, and selling merchandise. Um, somebody that uh, that I used to work with a few months ago has a pump house in um, hospitality in, in Ontario. He's got online, uh, doing a great job with his online sales of different uh, items. So, you know, I think JJ, it's great to mention that maybe, you know, you go to that one place where you have, you know, you love their sauce and you tell them, you probably have told them many times, you guys should bottle this and sell it. And they're just like, oh yeah, whatever. But now there's an opportunity for that. Right. And what does that do? It gets that, you know, people are going to have that sauce at home. Does that mean they're not going to come back to your restaurant ever again? No, because they like the way you make the stuff, but they're going to see that in their fridge. You're going to see what it's doing. It's just marketing to them every time they open their door. It's marketing your, so has anybody jumped into that space and started utilizing any of that type of thing that can maybe share some, uh, some ideas and and, uh, feedback? Doug, I don't know if you've talked to Scott or if you've just saw the stuff that I saw he'd posted, but. uh, um, Well, I think that what I noticed uh, during the summer and just early into the fall was the Ontario government looking at encouraging, uh, you know, people to support small to medium sized business with an online platform that was announced in Alberta as well. The U of A has got a program where university students are helping local Edmonton businesses, you know, great create that uh, online, you know, but I think if you look at the ability to take uh, even Square, just a simple payment system like Square has the ability to do gift cards and do a number of things. So it's, you know, making sure that people realize the payment systems they have 
does that retailer allow them or that provider or allow them opportunities to leverage their networks? I think this great this is a great forum for everyone to talk about, you know, who else can share best practices and who are you working with so that people can work together. So that's all I could see. I was just noticing because I'm big into the retail side is that a lot of brands are doing that and they're using Instagram as well to encourage people to buy things online. Yeah, no, definitely. Good point. Thank you, Doug. Uh, you mentioned something when you talked about using Instagram and that kind of thing. Um, and it was one of the things that brought me back to delivery. You know, I, I see a lot of restaurants will put together their Facebook page. They'll put it together their Instagram page, but they don't really manage them. And that restaurant I told you that has the, uh, the drive through, I think they have 17,000 people that are following them. And then I got another local restaurant who's not doing delivery has 230 people. Now, I don't know if that's the only correlation. These rest, both these restaurants, the, the, the one that's only got 230 has been around forever. It's a staple in this area of Prior Lake where I live in Minnesota. Uh, but to utilize those tools because people are on their social media. They're, they're on that stuff because it's their different outlets. They can't get outside like we talked about. So you need to grow those types of um, connections best. So uh, I know we've, I think we've got some marketers on. We've got a couple of minutes here. If somebody would like to jump in and just talk a little bit about, you know, marketing to and utilizing, you know, how to properly utilize those things to, uh, to reach your guests. I'd love to hear some, some feedback on that. Well, if you look at what we've, uh, can you hear me, Darren? I can. Yeah, How are you? you? Good. Thank you. You've Good. seen our technology. Uh, I have created uh, allows an operator to use a no touch technology and seamlessly uh, engage consumers, uh, promote their business, share socially, communicate through one agnostic mobile app. So it allows an entire community of businesses to all be featured and share the expense across hundreds of businesses versus one business going out or working with Square, Spot on those type of companies where there's a, a contract or integration required. So we've done beta testing with this and one particular restaurant wanted to go out of the gate and try it early. They ended up with more close by downloads than they had followers on Facebook. And they did that in about 90 days. Nice. Well, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it, it just, it, it kind of boggles my mind when I see some of the stuff where, you know, if you're going to create these things, you know, I, I was in a restaurant in, in my area the other day and I joined their Instagram page because I, I was there and there was only three other people that had joined the page, right? I mean, you need to manage these things and utilize them to, uh, to, uh, to get, to get connected to your guests. And if there's other opportunities like with freaking in close by, those are those are some great opportunities to try and build your platform. So again, it's looking for those outside of the box type of uh, type of ideas. So it's thank also, you for all Darren, that. Darren, it's also an opportunity to engage your, you know, every restaurant you go into has the social media, uh, you know, people that are consuming it every day, you know, find out within your staff who is the experts in it and hire them pay them right have them have them do something else they can serve a couple to skip the dish dishes and then they're doing something or they're dedicated to managing that and, and working on it but it's a great opportunity but also reaching out to the universities and colleges because they are trying to find ways for their students to be doing things to help local business it's a great idea doug thank you so much for sharing that great idea all right guys we have had discussions um we're sitting at uh, one minute to six. Um, if there was any other topics that maybe somebody wanted to bring up um, and talk about, you know, again, uh, I'm willing to stay on a little bit longer, but I want to respect everybody's time. Again, I will be sharing out uh, the recording, making it available to everybody and taking a bunch of notes and sharing those out. Um, you know, I do want to thank um, Chef Jason McBride and uh, the Real Hospitality Network for sharing this out to everybody and, and getting us such a great response to having people on here tonight. I really appreciate their help in getting this together. Um, but, you know, again, um, guys, if there's anything that uh, you would like to share that hasn't been uh, suggested, or if there's a question on a topic that uh, you'd like to ask, 
um, that we didn't get to, please put that in the chat. I'll be more than happy to go over that right now. Um, I will be putting together another session to go over uh, some of the stuff we talked about tonight and, and share some future, some further items uh, in the end of January, let everybody get through the holiday season and then uh, we can have another discussion. I'd hope to have uh, as many of you as possible there. Uh, to everybody who shared this evening, guys, thank you so much. You know, the, the real idea behind this again is as big as this industry is and the hospitality industry is huge, we are a small community. We are so interconnected and we need each other to survive and get through. So it's gonna take, takes a community to, uh, to keep this going. So I really do appreciate uh, all of your feedback, all of your insight and all of you joining us this evening. Um, I, I don't see anything new coming in. So with that guys, I will thank you for your time this evening. I really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to our next discussion in January. Uh, if I don't talk to you before, have a great safe and happy holiday season. And we look forward to seeing you in the new year guys. Right. Good night, thank you very much. <laughs>